Welcome to the Barbican, a room that some of us know well, I think some of us, myself included, have seen a lot of movies uh, in this space, and we will not be watching a movie. What you're looking at uh, is a copy of the original version of the Atlantic Charter, signed in 1941 off the coast of Newfoundland by Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, a sort of roadmap for the future of the world uh, after the Nazis had been vanquished. And it essentially set out a list of eight points by which the two countries committed essentially to establishing a new multilateral rules-based order for the future, an order premised on some fundamental principles, uh, liberal economic relations, self-determination and rights of peoples, a prohibition on the use of force. And you will see for yourself uh, various other uh, aspects that are addressed in that document. And that document was then the basis uh, after the end of the Second World War, May the 9th, 1945, in Europe a little later, uh, in other parts of the world, for a remarkable institution-building project. Of course, it began with the United Nations earlier that year as a successor, if you like, to the League of Nations, uh, the International Court of Justice, to uh, fill the void left by the demise of the permanent court, but a remarkable set of new institutions, the birth of modern international criminal law with the Nuremberg trial, birth of modern human rights with the Universal Declaration, the birth of modern trade law with the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and of course all of the specialized agencies. So it was, I think, by any standard, an absolutely remarkable moment, led by two countries, but not uh, put in place exclusively by those two countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, which of course today, and we can talk openly about this perhaps with our panel, find themselves in a rather different engagement with the multilateral order, ironically, that they created. And that may be the subject of questions uh, and conversation. Um, we are going to explore, if you like, the fitness for purpose of the order that was created almost 75 years ago. It'll be 75 years uh, next year. And we do so with an absolutely wonderful panel. Um, we can't quite cover all bases. Unfortunately, the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, Ms. Gilmore, is not able to come. An emergency has come up, so we will have to somehow deal with human rights uh, with our three panelists. Andrew Lang uh, from Edinburgh is going to deal more with the economic side. Farhane Yamin from London is going to deal with the environmental, but in particular climate change side and Leslie Van Jamori from Chatham House, but also SOAS, I think, uh, will look at matters from an American perspective. It, it is a complex field. It, it's, um, it, it's, it's not, I think, the state of the world today entirely black or entirely white. Uh, I've spent quite a few hours in the last two years focusing on the place of the Vatican in the period 1933 to 1945. And of course, you will know many of you, there is a literature in relation to the role of Pius XII, a book which describes him as Hitler's Pope, another book that describes him as an absolute angel. There is a multitude of complexities uh, in this current situation. It's not the case that the multilateral order has completely collapsed, nor is it the case that the multilateral order is in absolutely rude and fabulous health. It's plain that there are things going on which are premised on a multilateral framework. One thinks of Iran, one thinks of climate change, one thinks of the stagnation on lawmaking, and Andrew will say more about this, uh, in the WTO, and of course a multitude of other topics uh, that we could address. An individual country's engagement with the multilateral order is also extremely complex and directed in different ways depending on the nature of the rules that are being addressed. Some countries are extremely committed to a multilateral order in certain areas. Others are less committed in 
certain areas. And I think the purpose of the panel today, against the background of this really excellent conference, and I'm very sorry that I wasn't here yesterday, I just arrived from overseas this morning, but even yesterday I was getting tweets and WhatsApp and texts discussing, mentioning the real energy that there is, uh, and I personally commend all of the organizers for bringing together a very wide and disparate community. It's one of the great things about international law in the UK and in London, that it is a, a very broad church, and that is a wonderful thing. Uh, and the organizers have, I think, facilitated uh, the expression of that broad church in all of the panels, including on this panel. So it's a complex situation. The process we're going to follow is each of our panelists is going to make an introductory statement uh, of six or seven minutes in their particular area. I'll then coordinate a conversation between the panelists for about 30 minutes, and we'll then throw it open to the audience. And I have this terrifying iPad in front of me because I gather lots of questions are coming in by tweet or by other means. And so I will have to see whether I can work this contraption, which I'm sure I will be able to with help from others. Um, so without further ado, can I invite Andrew to introduce perhaps aspects of the issue of multilateralism in the economic domain? Andrew Lang. Brilliant. Thanks, Philippe. So as Philippe said, we've got six or seven minutes just to put a few things on the table. So let me just give you uh, 12 very brief points. Three. Three. <laughs> Three very brief points just to, just to start us off. First thing I wanted to do in terms of thinking about this theme of withdrawal from multilateralism was to distinguish between three different things. One, multilateralism as a temperament or an approach to international relations. Two, multilateralism as a structural feature of a legal order. And third, multilateral dispute settlement system. So I'll put dispute settlement system off to one side. In terms of the temperament, literally all I'm talking about is a, is a political sensibility which, is, which values working together, common projects, a spirit of cooperation, willingness to compromise, a systems orientation or an institution orientation. And I think, oh, and, and as a feature of law, I simply mean just a, a single set of rules more or less equally applying to the community of states or some substantial chunk of it. Right? So they're two different senses of multilateralism. And I think in terms of, we've, we've clearly had, one of the big stories is the erosion of the spirit of multilateralism. Multilateralism as a, as a temperament, a, a way of going about international relations. So we've seen a strengthening of a political sensibility domestically and internationally, which sees compromise as a weakness, which sees existing institutions as constraints to be overcome, which doesn't see any intrinsic value in working together or in building enduring alliances. And as I say, that's not just internationally, but obviously domestically. That's a much broad, broader cultural phenomenon. But I, so I would distinguish that from a withdrawal of multilateralism at that structural level. So are we seeing, as a second question, an erosion of the aspiration towards multilateralism as a structural feature of international economic law, say? And I think there the picture is a little more complex. And I, I can talk through this a lot more when we, when, we, when we get to the questions and so on. But certainly on the trade side, it seems to me the better way of, a, of seeing what is happening, and here I'm talking primarily about the United States, is, is an attempt, uh, I, I, I am with those who see this as an attempt to use leverage to change the content of a multilateral order, not necessarily seeing multilateralism as the enemy itself. All right? So I think the first best solution for the United States would be a different kind of multilateral order with different rules which deal with the China problem in a different way. But they're not particularly wedded to multilateralism as a solution. They're much more willing to give it up. Nevertheless, I don't see it as multilateralism being the enemy. The more difficult question is whether multilateralism of that second structural kind can actually exist without a commitment, without a temper, multilateral temperament? I guess that's a real, that for me that's a really important question because I, I have a feeling the answer might be no. I have a feeling the answer might be no. Perhaps we can talk about that. The second point I wanted to make is very simply that if it's true that the current challenges at the WTO and on the investment side and so on are, are primarily about using the threat of exit to get change to the system, maybe radical change, but still change within the system, then maybe the larger point, it points to a larger difficulty, which is the inadequacy of mechanisms 
of achieving substantive change without disruptive threats of exit. So in trade, obviously, we have the complete dysfunction of the negotiating machinery. We know for that for a long time the concerns about the dispute settlement system have been bubbling away without really any meaningful movement. We know that talk of NAFTA modernisation has been going on for a long time, but it required, apart from the TPP, it required, which was effectively a NAFTA modernisation, but it required a threat of exit to get movement on that and so on. Um, and essentially all of those processes were really going nowhere without the threat of a tantrum, a tantrum. And again, on the investment side, I think it's the same sort of story, that we know all the concerns about investment law, investment arbitration and so on, but, it, but, uh, uh, but clearly those countries which have over the last decade or so been exiting, the, the Bolivias, the Ecuadors, the Venezuelas, Italy and Russia from the Energy Charter Treaty and so on, Indonesia, India, have decided that that's, that's their mechanism for change. You know, that's the mechanism. So some way of, of some, finding some mechanism for change which is, which is less disruptive might be an important priority looking ahead. Final quick thing to put on the table, judicial dispute settlement. Clearly that, a commitment to multilateral, to judicial dispute settlement at the international level has been part of this spirit of cooperation from the 90s onwards. It's been an, it doesn't have to be part of a commitment to multilateralism, but this particular brand of multilateralism it has been. And clearly I think, though I'd, I'd be interested in others' views, it seems to me that this commitment is absolutely on a knife edge and really under threat. I think you know a lesson of the, the problems facing WTO dispute settlement now is that we've just been reminded of what somehow we already knew but we could avert our eyes, which is that judicial dispute settlement relies fundamentally on the acquiescence of a hegemon, and without that, it's very difficult for it to survive. Um, Right now, the United States and, and some other countries are just very clearly operating outside the law. I think we can talk about this. I think the US-China situation, to the extent that it gets resolved, will be another mechanism by which, which will be somehow extra legal or extra systemic. Um, and I think all of this absolutely changes the character of, of international adjudication, even to the extent that it continues. Because if you've got a period like this, with the result being countries clearly breathing down the necks of adjudicators as they go about their business. Of course, that absolutely changes the experience of adjudication. Um, and I think it may well do serious damage to perceptions of impartiality and willingness to submit to adjudication on the part of other countries more generally. So they're the three points. Uh, and just, just to follow on, because I mean, people who are not specialists in the field may not be aware that in the next few weeks, right. the appellate body will cease to function. Okay. Because it will cease to be quarried because the United States has blocked the appointment of one or more new members and it will fall below the required number of members. So we actually reach the point where the system will no longer be able to function. Exactly. So yeah, so just to so since two thousand and sixteen onwards, whenever a vacancy on the appellate body body has arisen the United States has refused to give consent to the initiation of the process of the replacement of the appellate body. And so, and, and there are seven appellate body members, three sit on any particular case. So when you fall below three, you can't hear a case. Now that doesn't mean that the entire system necessarily dies because the panel procedure does continue. And depending on who you speak to, well, there are, there are many different paths here. But of course, the danger is once you take away the appellate body, it's not that the panel procedure goes away. The, the danger is appealing into the void, which means that you lose the case, you appeal, but there's no appellate body to hear the appeal. And so the procedure of getting the panel report adopted, making it binding, can never take place. So that's really the danger here. I think there's many different ways of interpreting what's going on here. We can talk about them. I don't want to use up time. But again, it seems to me, particularly with John Bolton now gone, with, and, I mean, he was never really on the trade side, but that sort of anti-multilateralist voice in the administration, it seems to me the better view on this is that it's, it is about leverage to achieve broader change within the system. Leverage coupled with a willingness, yes, to destroy dispute settlement, without a doubt. But it seems to me it, it's a point of leverage, not, not necessarily a desire to, to remove judicial dispute settlement altogether. But nature and the international order abhors a void, and into the space left by the United States, in this domain, comes China. Absolutely. Which is 
very strongly committed so, to a multilateral order. So you introduced the, 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 so the, the United States and the UK, and you said in, co in, in, in cooperation with others. Of course, China, is the, the, for, for some years now, for two, two or three years, has been saying, we are one of the countries that established this architecture. We are, you know, this is the consistent message you get again and again. And certainly within the WTO and within the trade field, they are positioning themselves very strongly as a champion of the multilateral order. Including dispute settlement, which of course mm. is not the case when you come to UNCLOS and what the Chinese consider to be political type disputes in right. relation to the South China Seas. So it, it's, it's a very complex picture where you yes. have a reversal and the US and others four square behind dispute settlement in that context, but they don't like WTO dispute settlement. Absolutely, yeah. Fahana, you have been involved in the climate change negotiations literally from day one. I did a little bit from about 89 to 94. You've been in from the get-go almost 30 years. What's happening in the environmental field and the climate change context on multilateralism more generally? What bigger themes do you draw out from what you've observed? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you to the organizers for this amazing uh, event, actually. I've learned a lot today. And um, I think one of the things that I do want to touch on is actually large parts of the world are not in this room currently. Um, and so for next time, please raise your ambitions further. Book twice the, you know, um, twice the space that you need from here and let's invite China, let's invite India, let's invite the three billion youth who are also probably not represented here. So I don't mean that as a criticism, I mean that really to tie in with the point that I want to make, that international law, especially climate change, is now being held driven and will be taken forward by the rest of the world, not necessarily the, the powers that drew up this, not necessarily the powers that came together in the aftermath of the World War II and establish the architecture that we're talking about and established, I think, the norms that we work along, which is essentially that, you know, general international law principles and the principles of, you know, civilized countries would be concretized, you know, gaps would be filled by treaty law and negotiations under different frameworks and that they would then be subject to dispute resolution, adjudication, different processes, and the precedents would then bind and you know allow us to to work in the way that we think lawyers work and i think that model is really flawed and it uh, on the one hand is taking root and shapes us very fa fundamentally but on the other hand as as you know um andrew has pointed out um the temperament at the moment is to completely get rid of that way of thinking um, and in the climate change context we've had many examples of where in the, the US principally has chosen to come and go from multilateral negotiations. So obviously we had, as many of you know, spent um, almost five or six years negotiating the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and its rules. It finally came into force in 2005 after George Bush had rejected it and said that the, U the US was not going to, to, to in any way ratify it. Um, at that time, the 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 rest of the world came together, including the EU, including China, including eventually Russia. Um, and I think that in the end, my gut instinct is a similar thing will happen with respect to the climate change uh, and Paris Agreement negotiations, which President Trump uh, committed the US to withdrawing from. That withdrawal cannot take place until the 4th of November, which is the day after the election, he'll still be president until the new, pre new president or he's um, confirmed. But it, technically, they're still in the negotiations. Um, but what I saw last week is, maybe I can just tell a little anecdote. So, so the UN Secretary General convened a summit for heads of state, which took place on the 23rd of September. That summit was convened in order for him to specifically give uh, a bit of a push to the Paris negotiations um, uh, and, and specifically the deadline to submit the second round of, of commitments, nationally determined uh, contributions. The first round were committed, uh, were, were submitted just before the Paris uh, Agreement in 2015. The next ones are due five years later uh, in, in 2020. So he convened this summit and um, essentially he asked countries and heads of state to come with a commitment to increasing the ambition 
of those uh, second subsequent uh, submissions, he asked countries to consider phasing out fossil fuels, in particular uh, subsidies, and in particular to phase out coal. Um, he said very clearly, if you don't come forward with uh, any of those things or new commitments, I'm not going to give you a platform to speak at this summit. You know, he really stuck his neck out. He broke with the traditional norms in the UN General Assembly. Many heads of state said they didn't want to speak or would that then not come, including President Trump himself. But in the end, he came. And he came because of what I see as very much a pattern that's emerging now. He came because his friend uh, uh, Modi uh, wanted him to come. So literally, as we're sitting in the General Assembly Hall, a huge you know, uh, uh, um, uh, entourage arrives, uh, it, it passes Greta, as you may have seen, uh, who looks very crossly at what's happening, um, arrives. And it, the, President Trump watches the speech of Modi. Um, uh, he's there for about eight minutes, and then he leaves. And I think there was a huge discomfort in the room, not just because we'd already heard from Greta and were reeling from you know, the, the, the discomfort that you know, this uh, accountability um, will come from the younger generations, but because actually the entire structure of diplomacy of the UN Secretary General's authority of the UN General Assembly itself was just, you know, in those eight minutes, you could just see it torn apart and people not knowing quite how to deal with it. Um, the good news is, though, the f same day um, I left the General Assembly at 6 p.m., uh, 16 youth, including Greta Thunberg, um, submitted a, a communication to the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child under op uh, Article 5 of the optional, third optional protocol, um, uh, outlining essentially a request for, the, for the, the human rights body under that uh, um, uh, uh, to, to deal with their claim that their human rights are being breached and that uh, environmental law and human rights together uh, are going to uh, be life-threatening for all children around the world and young people, that they're going to uh, significantly impact their health, that they're going to impinge on their cultural rights and do not conform with um, the requirement, the legal requirement under the Rights of the Child Convention, which has been ratified by every single country except the US, um, to, to maintain their culture. So I, I, I sort of stress that because I think what we're, going, what we're seeing is actually a huge affirmation from the rest of the world, essentially to uphold the multilateral legal order. Um, I make no... Um, I work very closely with the small island states I have done for nearly 30 years, and they are you know, figuring out how to deal with the, the, the lack of engagement by the US. And it, it's not just a lack, it's a full on onslaught, actually. So there was a few months when there weren't enough um, instructions, and they kept quiet, and the old team was there. But it's now a full on assault. Um, there's withdrawal, obviously, of the financial obligations that the U.S. was meant to make good. Some of the announcement at the Secretary General Summit were to make good some of the financial promises that have been made by, by, the, by the richer countries. But what we saw in general was uh, the use by the U.S. Of, um, of their diplomatic clout, which is considerable, to either silence or upset or, 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 or disrupt uh, uh, those proceedings. Um, so, so I don't want to leave uh, my end comments on um, a, neg a negative note. Um, I do think what's happened generally uh, over the last uh, six or seven decades is, is actually the rest of the world, you know, and I speak very much as someone who's from Pakistan who works very closely with most of the developing countries, they've understood, accepted, and want to be part of the international legal order, and they want to shape it and create it, and they have um, developed enough economically and socially to affirm the underlying universal values that were in, that inspired, you know, some of some of the things that are up there. And what they're finding is, as they come to the table and want to take their rightful place and want to take. Um, uh, uh, those norms forward domestically and internationally, the sort of rugs being pulled from under their feet. Uh, and I think uh, many of the G20 countries are really, um, yeah, really following, you know, to the extent possible, really follow, following that, um, following that club's chums 
a return of the age of empires and unaccountable sovereigns. Um, but I think overall, um, developing countries will carry the day. I hope that the legal community, the legal profession, all of us open up uh, our hearts, our minds, our proceedings, our bars, our practices, our chambers, our law schools, to many, many more people who see a place for international law, who affirm human rights, who affirm the vision of universality, uh, and who affirm the rule of law. And I think that's what will happen. And that's, you know, frankly, there are thousands of Greta's everywhere. It's, it's not a one-person movement. Um, you know, it's not possible for one person to turn out seven million people in the course of one week uh, on, um, and on less than six months of organizing. So I think the youth will keep uh, accountable and hold us um, very much to making the world a better place. So, so to paraphrase slightly, I mean, our title for this panel is Withdrawing from Multilateralism. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing is that it's not so much as the world withdrawing from multilateralism as a certain number of countries led by one country in particular. And of course that does put on the agenda, and we can come back to it in the conversation since we're in London, since the United Kingdom seems to be increasingly joined to the hip to the United States, um, what the impact will be of the United Kingdom hitching its wagon to the American model rather than the European Union. Uh, model, but it, it, is that fair that what you're seeing in the field of climate change is not a withdrawal from multilateralism, it's a transformation of a commitment to multilateralism in which one or two or more of the major countries that drafted that instrument are effectively saying we are no longer the hegemon so we want to change the structure. I, th I think it is and I'm going to be uh, even more blunt. It's countries who are excessively dependent on fossil fuels and business as usual, particularly in respect of natural resources. And there's a paragraph up there which uh, deals with natural resources. And so what you're finding now, you know, when you mention some of the countries that um, the US model is appealing to, are currently in the grip of fossil fuel interests. So this isn't just any old sector. These are the largest companies in the world. I'll make no bones about what I you know, have been doing recently. I'm wearing an Extinction Rebellion badge, and in April I glued myself to the Shell building. Um, a few weeks before I did that, a report came out showing that the top five oil companies in the world had poured $1 billion into greenwashing, lobbying, and marketing, um, and, you know, 3% a, a of their revenues and future spend is going on renewables. The rest is going on digging up more oil, gas, and on undermining uh, legislation around the world. So I think what's going on is a very complicated story, but if we had to simplify it, it's the, a, a, a tiny global elite that stands to lose a lot from where the rest of the world needs and want to go. That's what's going on. Okay. And all sorts of legal strategies are being used We've been used to the legal strategies of making law, you know, internationally and through national law and through courts. But I think other legal strategies are coming into play. And one of those legal strategies is nonviolent civil disobedience, which many lawyers take part in and support and which, you know, led to the greatest uh, realignments of when justice and our laws were not aligned. So you, you, that's what is happening currently, not just in this country, but many other countries. And that's what the demand, I think, of, of the disruptive movements who are using law, not just Greta Thunberg and the youth, but Sunrise in the US, um, Extinction Rebellion here, and many, many others, actually. There, there's hundreds of them. So that's what they're, they're going for. They see a mismatch between what's on offer um, and what's happening in the legal systems and what the demands of justice, and in particular, what the demands of ecological safety now require of us. Leslie, um, we thought that the US might have a role to play on this panel, and we wanted someone who really could give us a particular perspective on that. Um, you will recall, as I do, one of the previous Prime Minister's parting acts when she received President Trump was to give him a copy of this document. Um, I don't know who came up with that idea, 
there is a certain irony. Um, that we've always had American exceptionalism. Is what is happening now different? Do you share the analysis of Andrew and Fahona as to the direction that is being taken in the United States? Um, yeah, no, I'm glad you made that point because it was actually something I had sort of scribbled down as I was sitting here that, you know, at, at one level you could argue America has never really wanted to be constrained. It's wanted to create the rules. It's built in exceptions to the rules and then it's exercised additional exceptions. Uh, and sometimes it's just remained outside the rules. The International Criminal Court is, is the obvious case in point and, you know, decided to play more or less ball depending on the inclinations of the president, the people around him, and the activities of the court in that case. So there is, you know, there is a sense in which some general contours of uh, what is taking place has resonance throughout the entire post-war period. Um, but I guess I wanted to address, you know, in saying that, this broader question of, you know, is it fundamentally different and America's engagement with um, global governance, the formal multilateral framework, uh, and is it coming back? What, is what we're seeing indicative, how much is it different and is it indicative of a radical transformation of America's role in the world? And I guess in, in, in pointing out the, um, the obvious exceptionalism, I also wanted to point out uh, the data that all Americans who live in London are wanting to talk about right now, which is the recent study, there have been two over the last couple of years, uh, but the most recent study from the Chicago Council, who does these great you know, public opinion uh, polls of, of Americans, and because they're in Chicago, you, we take them even that much more seriously. It's not just a coastal thing. And as you know, we saw in the recent poll, um, American attitudes in favor of international leadership are very high. 69% of Americans want the US to be active in world affairs. Obviously, that raises a lot of questions about in which way. Um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a significant number and I think one that we should take seriously. We know that um, the American support of Paris went up when the president withdrew from Paris, that Americans remain highly committed to NATO, um, and on any number of dimensions you see quite a lot of, a majority of Americans committing, uh, and while there are partisan divisions, they're not as great as you might think with one very serious, very significant, and I would argue extremely worrying exception, and that's on immigration, where the, the difference between Republican attitudes and Democratic attitudes is grave. And uh, Republican attitudes, according to this poll, in support of immigration, such as we, the spirit of immigration that probably a lot of people in this room um, adhere to, are extremely low. Uh, far below 50%. So I think that, and, and that I think reflects the current administration and it reflects uh, the issue that is likely to be the number one or two most significant issue going forward in 2020. But on this, on this question of, you know, to what extent is this current administration such as it is a game changer or was this a long time coming in which case we should, you know, expect to see more of the same regardless of how long um, uh, Trump remains president. I tend to think it's not going to be past 2020, and it might be sooner before he's not president. I really do think that, um, which makes me an absolute outlier. Um, but I would argue that it's both. It's clearly been a long time coming that the institutions that were created in the post-war period no longer reflect the distribution of power, uh, that America's uh, relative um, primacy has declined, and therefore it was going to ask for more, want to play a different sort of game, um, expect to engage with the rise of China in a very different way, especially given that the consensus in the United States is that the model of trying to treat China like a responsible stakeholder simply hasn't worked. So at some level, there was going to be a change, but there's a very significant difference between saying it was a long time coming and it was inevitably going to look like this under no conditions was it going to look like this? And I firmly believe that under no conditions will it look like this when there's a change of administration. And I would point to you know, one sort of overall difference, which is really the critical difference. President Obama had a very clear understanding that the structure of international politics had changed and America's engagement had to change. It had to address China differently. It needed to pull back from the Middle East. In order to do that, he wanted to reframe America's orientation, his relationship, 
with Iran. And in order to work with uh, China, it actually, he actually pursued an institutionalist strategy designed to exclude it, right, the TPP, while incentivizing it to perhaps come back or to come into that fold at a later date. So he was thinking globally, he was thinking institutionally, he was thinking collaboratively, the Iran deal, but he was certainly thinking about shifting. Like President Trump, uh, he failed to pull the United States out of the Middle East. Note that the number of troops and the level of defense spending under the current president has gone up. The level of engagement has gone up, but clearly the style has radically changed. And, I, and I'll just close and, uh, just, and just sort of you know, point out things that maybe we can come back to, which is that my, uh, my concern is that the commitment to regional security um, arrangements is taking a hammering, the withdrawal from the INF Treaty, the withdrawal from um, the Iran deal, the style of engagement, bilateral without any serious attempt to cooperate on dealing with North Korea. Um, is a style that will have uh, repercussions for whoever comes in next. And, and I would argue that many of uh, the existing or the previous arrangements that, have, that we've seen a walk back from, there's no going back. There's no going back to the INF Treaty. Um, if you look at what the Democratic candidates say about the Iran deal, none of them say we want exactly the same deal. The game has changed. They all say that we want more. We want missiles in there. Uh, we want to deal with Iran's uh, regional engagement. We want a deal, but we want a different deal. So the game has undoubtedly changed. The standards have lifted. But I do think that when there is a change, and I do firmly believe that there will be a change, um, that we will see an effort to recover some sort of working within a new set of rules and collaborating um, with some of the old partners uh, as well as some new partners. And I'll stop there. I, I, I can see the description that you're providing about what is going on and it resonates, but one thing that I see also in the areas in which I work is the substitution by the United States policymakers, this administration, but also previous administrations, of replacing either regional or global multilateral arrangements with a multitude of bilateral arrangements on the basis that if you're going to uh, have an arrangement with five countries, you as the hegemon have much more leverage if you have five bilateral arrangements than a single multilateral arrangement. And we're seeing that with the effort by the Trump administration, which failed to get out of the NAFTA, to kill the NAFTA completely and replace it with two bilateral arrangements. That failed. Will a future administration, Republican or Democrat, continue in that direction? And what are the implications? Because the other context where you see this, particularly I've just come back actually this morning from South America, people are very concerned about Venezuela, and you get the sense that somehow the US bilateral approach in dealing with Venezuela, not multilateralizing, not dealing it through regional institutions in South America has failed. And they have not achieved the change they told everyone six months they were going to achieve. So have we reached a point where someone in the United States will come to recognize that the bilateral model, the multitude of bilateral arrangements, actually isn't going to work anymore? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, I was, you know, I, I like to go through and name the deals, right? Afghanistan, the, the effort to talk with the Taliban, um, Iran, the effort to negotiate a new deal, North Korea, the effort to achieve denuclearization through a maximum, pre maximum pressure and then talking Venezuela, you know, recognizing uh, an opposition that doesn't seem to have any capacity to rule. Um, I can't come up with a single, I, I can come up with one bilateral deal where the Trump administration has been successful. I don't personally think that it's been successful in a way that's good, but I think it's been successful and that's the US pressure on Mexico um, to take a different tack with respect to immigration um, and, and the southern border. Mexico has radically changed what it does at its northern and its southern border uh, to the detriment of a number of you know, people um, in the region. So I think that a, the next leader of the US will look around and recognize that they'd like to accomplish something and that they can't actually do it alone. So I suspect that it won't be more of the same. However, and this is, I guess, the caveat which concerns me, there is a narrative that's been constructed in the U.S. Plenty of people push back against it, but it, you know, it's sort of like you keep moving the baseline, right? The baseline was sort of cooperate. <laughs> uh, Hillary Clinton worked very hard to restore the notion that America should cooperate. Obama was obviously on side of that. 
Um, and now, you know, cooperate, we sort of nudged it down. And so I, I do think that even as a new leader um, seeks to cooperate more, that there will be a bullishness that's been unleashed. Just, Fahana wants to come in, but I just want to ask one final question, since we are in London, since many people here are British. I touched on the UK-US relationship. Seen from my perspective, it's clear that what this administration is trying to do is actively prize the UK out of the orbit of the European Union with a sort of double agenda, strengthening perhaps or not its own relationship with the United Kingdom, but also destroying the European Union as a functioning order. I'm married to an American. She says constantly, and has for 30 years, the special relationship is a one-way relationship. Britain has a special relationship with the United States. The United States does not have a special relationship with the United Kingdom. What is your perspective on that relationship and where it might go? Yeah, so I don't think that, you know, to have a special relationship, it has to be an equally special relationship for everybody. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I do actually believe that it is a distinct and special relationship. I think that, it, and you know, it's the thing that nobody, nobody knows how to talk about, but it's a comfort zone politics. It's a, it's just, it's a cultural thing, right? Of course, there are very concrete things, right? Defense, security, intelligence, universities, exchanges, we know all of it, but it's a comfort zone politics, which gives me confidence that it isn't going to go away because at the end of the day, when you want to partner, you still want something you can trust. And I've certainly heard, as I'm sure we have all, um, very senior American officials uh, speak to that. And even with reference to other countries that one would think might be in that zone of comfort, like Germany, for example. Um, so yes, obviously Trump would love nothing more than to pull apart the European Union. I don't think that that, share, that view is in any way shared um, across the rest of the foreign policy establishment in the US. Fahana, you want to? Well, just, just to say on climate change, there was no attempt at negotiating an alternative to Paris. You know, um, on the night that President-elect uh, Trump's, um, the, the election was, uh, results came in, I was in Marrakesh at the first meeting of the Paris Agreement parties, and, and, and uh, 24 hours later, we were on alert that he made tweet, even though he hadn't become president then, he made tweet that he was going to withdraw, um, and actually six months later, he did withdraw with no real effort having been put into what an alternative vision would look like. And of course, domestically, um, uh, and, and, and his agenda has been to absolutely uh, destroy and roll back all of the environmental protection regulations, essentially in, in the US, including of protected areas. And you know, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds. It's a serious assault uh, on, on that area of law. Just on this question of the UK's special relationship with the US, I think climate change will be the litmus test of where the UK wants to be. Um, as many of you may know, the UK will now host in Glasgow next year the follow-up to the Paris Agreement, the, the five-year, uh, 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 you know, which is going to be a huge conference, probably 30, 50,000 people, probably heads of state uh, will come uh, to that. And I think the UK has done that because the UK sees itself as a leader of climate change. You know, we've enacted uh, net zero emissions by 2050, which is not fast enough at all, but it is uh, much faster than many other countries and certainly the first G20 country to do that. So I think whether the UK prioritizes its bilateral trade, uh, straightforward economic uh, interests and sacrifices its climate leadership or not is going to be found out or not. And obviously the EU is very much uh, been a champion on climate change issues. So we'll see whether which way the UK looks, I think, uh, early next year. But right now, I have to say, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good means what? I, I think this particular... Look, I, I'm speaking as an NGO, as an activist, this doesn't look good because the current government, whilst having uh, enacted the net zero le legislation, is currently not on track on any of its carbon budgets. And it's... Uh, 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 the way in which it will pursue uh, a, a, a no-deal Brexit will mean that our environmental legislation and all the framework, especially enforcement, will be 
uh, completely trashed. So um, there's no way that it, I see at the moment uh, this particular government, who knows what will happen you know, in, the, in the coming months, um, actually in, in, in essence prioritising environmental protection, in, in, in fact prioritising climate leadership, which is what we need. So what you're saying there, in effect, is that the withdrawal from the European Union is a withdrawal from regional multilateralism yep. and that that will have profound effects in the field that you're talking about. Yeah, and I, I'll be really blunt. You know, I, I think that there is no attempt to put it, an alternative framework in, in place. Uh, these aren't... What's happening cannot be explained by, oh, we didn't get enough in the Iran Treaty or we didn't get enough in climate change. We're going to adjust that. We want this and this. And, you know, our negotiations were bad and our regional partners pulled us down. That's not what's happening. What's happening is a full-scale assault and the creation of chaos and fear, which we know politically benefits authoritarianism and the right, and it benefits uh, um, uh, divide-and-rule politics, which is what we're seeing. And you're seeing those in uh, predominantly the countries that are dependent on a natural use uh, extraction, fossil fuels and nature extraction, Brazil being a classic example, where they would rather continue with whatever it takes, including trashing ideals to democracy, closing down, shutting off the space for the basic liberties and the basic rights that we've seen. Um, I was in the panel this morning on human rights. You know, you're seeing in every major country, including in the, in the European Union, including in East Europe, Turkey, Brazil, everywhere, you know, environmental defenders, which I know most, are being killed and murdered, are being imprisoned, are openly, you know, uh, 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 surve uh, surveillance techniques, the full works. Uh, that's what's going on. And I think that the conditions of chaos favour certain types of energies and not others. And there's a little bit of literature about that. It's not just my conjecture, but the creation of this chaos comes from um, and is organised and is orchestrated and certain technologies and elites are manipulating uh, public opinion. And I, again, don't, don't absolutely, you know, eyes on the prize. We have to maintain our support um, for democracy, deepen it, strengthen it, support the values of universalism, support human rights, support the basic liberties that we've established and not chuck them out, you know, whole scale at this point. Well, which we, is kind we, see, of what we see it. We see it in other areas. Not, that's not, that is also in, for example, in freedom of expression, wearing another hat, I'm president of English Pen. And we're seeing it with the number of journalists and writers who are being arrested around the world is increasing absolutely dramatically and we are not seeing many of the countries including the UK and the US who were at the forefront of intervening to protect the rights of those journalists doing that anymore that that has come to an end so the aspiration that is reflected in the document up on the screen behind us has already in that sense come to an end uh, Andrew you wanted to come in so maybe something quickly about the US UK relationship as it as it as it plays out in the trade side and then maybe just return quickly to the rest of the world issue so on the US and UK so uh, obviously everybody's view of, of of what the UK's interests are differs and rightly so but but my view is that it, it's very clear that in terms of economic interests, in terms of the shape of the international order and so on, the UK's and the EU's interest, interests are so fundamentally aligned that ultimately when it comes down to it, if there is a choice between two visions, I think that alignment will ultimately, that, that choice will be made. The complication of the US, the UK uh, um, relationship for me, so for me the US, UK relationship is a complicating factor in the sense that it limits the ways in which and the extent to which the UK can act as that systemic pro-multilateral voice, particularly within the, w within the WTO. So what I'm hearing everywhere is, yes, of course, the UK is and will continue to be a defender of the multilateral system. By no means is the, you know, say Brexit or whatever, a, a, a step away from that at all. The complication is, of course, is that you expend real political capital in taking initiatives, making alliances, maybe working with China, you know, seeking to defend the system and so on. But of course, you're taking real risks. You, you want to stay on the fence. You want to be able to take that multilateral position and at the same time have your free trade agreement with the United States, have your cooperation with the United States. And that's such a tricky position to be in that ultimately I think it, 
it will have the unfortunate result of, of, of making it more difficult for the UK, UK to express what I think are its underlying true interests. Well, you, you say so, that the UK is still committed to that multilateral order, but um, I mean, having known the current Prime Minister for more than 30 years, he doesn't give a toss about multilateralism. He, if it serves his interests to move into a completely different direction, he will go into a completely different direction. And we've got an example, actually. You have France and Germany at the UN right now promoting a project on support for an endangered multilateralism. And I think if the UK had not left the EU, the UK would be the third partner in that project. But it is not the third partner in that project. Right, so that particular example could play, but could play to my story or your story. Yeah, so both. Explain but, a bit more. The well, no, but I guess no. I guess so. I don't know the current prime minister. Certainly not for thirty years. But uh, so. <laughs> so I. But all I all know. So all I can say is that is that so within within within. The, the, the particular parts of the civil service and, and the government and so on who are dealing particularly with trade, I mean, this is absolutely 100% the consistent message, the consistent message. And of course, of course it is in some ways. Of course the UK, well, so you do hear, even from those within the milieu you're mentioning, of the UK being in support of the rule of law. If there's one thing the UK stands for, it's the international rule of law and so on. Now one can, you know, react to that however one wants, but that is an aspiration or at least a self uh, and a part of uh, the, the identity of the UK as it seeks to project itself on the international stage. And, I, and in, in the specific WTO context, I haven't heard anything except the UK will continue to be a supporter of the system. Um, so, 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 so there's that. Well, um, I won't say anything about yeah. compliance with international decisions, but let's imagine yeah. the implications of the recent domestic issue on the Supreme Court. I mean, it might seem like it's outside our bailiwick, but to have an attorney general, and this is politicians, this is not the civil servants, just I, we all know the distinction between the two, but to have an, an attorney general and a prime minister to say what they said about a unanimous judgment of the Supreme Court in the tone and terms they did is heard all over the world. I've just come back from Chile and Argentina and people are stunned because they see the United Kingdom as absolutely committed to the rule of law. And the question, and I am not alone, other people in the room will have got the same question, what is going on in the United Kingdom? So you may well be no, right. It may be that there is no change, but all of us who travel around the world are deluged with questions. <laughs> what the hell is going on in the United yeah, Kingdom? I, no, I mean, I really don't mean to be, at, at all mean to be saying there's no change, there's nothing to worry about. That is absolutely 100% not my position at all. I'm just, I, but I, but I actually, I just, I would, in this, in the specific field that I'm talking about, I, I actually would stick with the position that I, I don't. And this is part of what I was trying to say in the opening remarks: is that absolutely there's a change in temperament. Absolutely, that's a real danger. Um, but at the same time, I don't see, certainly not. I actually don't see within the UK, and 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 I do see in the US, but to a lesser extent than others, a a a destroy multilateralism for the sake of destroying multilateralism. For me, it's about, on the US side now I'm talking, for me it's about, I'm a hegemon, I can extract more out of this, the rules can be more in my favor, why don't I do that? Right, here's my leverage. Yeah. Uh, Leslie. I, 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 I mean, there, there's clearly a lot of that in the White House right now. But I think that the debate is a bit more sophisticated, not to be, well. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that I can get more out of it. And actually, guess what? Russia's been cheating on the IMF treaty for a very long time. And maybe the way to go about it isn't just to keep pretending that nothing's happening and that China isn't developing missiles. And all that. I mean, so I think part of it isn't just we can throw our weight around. It's, gosh some of the institutions don't actually work and maybe instead of trying to fix them, we should do something different. Now that's where the debate is, right? Do you try to fix them or do you just do something radically different? And Trump hasn't even engaged really in the try to, do you try to fix them? But I, I don't think it's actually fair to say, you know, they were great and we're just gonna, you know, and we're just throwing our weight around. I think there is something that's, I mean, there's clearly many things that have changed since many of the institutions were created. So there's, a, and, and you know, it's to the detriment actually of securing a multilateral or regional or rule-based future to pretend like things haven't changed, like there, that there aren't real um, structural problems in, the, in many of the institutions themselves. I guess I'll summarize it as this. The underlying 
social movements that have led to the polarization and you know to Trump to, to what we have Brexit are very similar and essentially it's a desire uh, 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 and the telling of a story that we can't cope anymore with what's to come unless we build legal and physical walls our standard of life is threatened our you know multilateral institutions will not be able to cope um, and that's the underlying reality it's a drawing up of the the bridge and it's to protect your own and that's why it's called America first and that's what underlines I think the reality of many people who did not gain sufficiently under globalization and who the Brexit tears have said your best bet is if we draw up the bridges and focus very much on putting you know Britain first I, I think that that reality is informed by the climate and ecological crisis that everyone is facing because you know people are on the move migration is happening in millions human rights it's not just a, a legal concept P people are dying and I'm I'm not you know, saying these emotive terms, it, this is real. That's why all these scientists are saying all of this stuff. And I think our politics is reflecting a very polarized vision of what is possible and what's the right strategy. You know, do we have a, essentially a cooperative, collaborative strategy where we, you know, pitch in and help support each other and have a kinder society, which is what happened in the aftermath of the Second World War. People decided that they didn't want to go through that again and they you know, the imperialism and the colonialism and the breakdown and but, but, law led to that. And right now we're in this massive conflict in our political or social systems where unless we name it and say, which side are you on? You know, we're not going to really be able to move further. And as lawyers, we're seeing that through the different approaches to multilateralism in each of the different areas that we work in. But fundamentally... That's where we are right now between people who want essentially to collaborate and create a new kind of uh, global economy that is rights respecting, that is nature respecting, and that is going to leave a better planet for our future generations and those who find that too much of a threat and can't get their head around it. But, but the history of international law, it might be said, is one of construction, disaster, destruction, reconstruction. You go back to the 17th century, then 1815, then 1918, then 1945, and that model is we are on the road to some sort of catastrophic event. And until we reach that moment, the next version of the Atlantic Charter, or whatever takes its place, will have to wait. Let me stop there. Can I invite you to thank our three wonderful panelists for fantastic contributions?